Good to see everyone here this morning and all the different uh, rooms and in all the different venues. We've got our middle, middle schoolers uh, gathering in the back now. If you are in middle school and would like to worship on a, a worship level, on your own level with your, your peers, then you could go back to the back of the worship center now. We've got some folks waiting to help you make your way down to the teen center, and they'll have their own worship service down there. Uh, younger than middle school, we've got uh, Kids Point downstairs. And they've been down there all morning, but you're welcome to join them too if you're below uh, middle school. Through the week, we have a meeting for the, the older teenagers. I think it's usually on Wednesday, sometimes on Thursday nights, depending on what's happening with their school schedule and their sports schedules. But uh, they have their midweek meeting down at the teen center as well. So Wes, thank you for taking care of our uh, young people back there. And give Wes a hand as he goes downstairs and or goes across the parking lot and has that worship uh, service down there. And by the way, give Kevin and Leah a hand for being with us and helping us with our worship this morning. Thank you so much. And we've got Grandma and Grandpa here and Gracie and Rosie here as well. And I don't know your name, young man. Can you help me with it? Nope. Was it Ben? Ben, okay, very good. Sorry that my memory's not good enough to, to remember that, but good having you here, Ben, also. Um, Blake and Noel are on vacation this morning, and it's a well-deserved vacation. Blake is a very hard-working uh, young man here at the church, and uh, you probably know much that he does, and, and much that he does you probably don't know, but he arrives here between 5 and 6 o'clock every Sunday morning to prepare the worship service to go smoothly. He was actually here this morning, even though this morning was his first day of vacation, but he wanted to make sure the church service was, was well prepared and that uh, everything was here for Kevin and Leah, and I was so proud of Blake uh, for doing that. But also, uh, not just the service here, but Blake prepares our online uh, offering so that folks who who can't be here with us, they can join us online. And we do welcome all the folks that are joining us online right now in all the different social channels that Blake has, has uh, provided for the, the service to be accessed on. We, we have about 30 to 40 uh, different uh, devices that come to our church service on Sunday morning through our webpage lvcc.church. Blake makes sure that anyone that goes to our webpage at 1015 can receive this service live as I'm sure my wife is hosting this service from the house. I'm sure uh, those folks are watching now, folks that, that really cannot safely meet together with us right now, but they don't want to miss out on the, on the church service and what's happening here. But in addition, uh, we have another 20 or 30 that are uh, watching the service through the church's Facebook page. And then we have no idea how many people are watching um, through their, um, and Megan, you can help me with this, through their uh, private parties on Facebook. Did I say that right, Megan? I know you throw these private parties and, and have our church services um, accessible by your friends. You can invite your friends to a private viewing of the church worship service. And since it's private, we don't have any idea how many <laughs> how many people are watching through those on-roads to our church service right now either. But somewhere, somewhere between 50 and 80 different uh, folks that would not be able to join us in-house are joining us online. And Blake is the one that largely, Jeff a little helps with that. Uh, my wife hosts that. I think Jody hosts it a little bit too. Um, uh, Blake makes, makes all of that uh, possible as well. So he he, he hasn't had time off in a long time. He certainly deserves one. We pray he'll get a restful week with his wife, Noel. His wife, Noel, is one of our hospital nurses in Columbus, and she's been ministering to the COVID patients throughout this entire stint, and she certainly deserves a well-deserved break. Amen? And uh, so we're, we're praying those two will be having uh, a, a nice break here uh, together. What, what a year what a year we've been having uh, this year with all the hurricanes that we've been having, uh, with all the coastal flooding, with all the forest fires out west, all the riots and the shootings and the civil unrest in our country right now, the lack of confidence in our national electoral process, 
uh, the ugliest political division I've ever seen in my lifetime in this country. Uh, I, just, I just hate that that's going on. We've even had an attempted governor kidnapping this week. It's just, uh, just amazing what's happening. And, and that's besides this blasted coronavirus thing that's going on. I mean, all the effect that this has had on us. This is, this is unreal. Is there anybody here that's ready to say enough already? I've had enough. Let's move on from all this. You remember hear stories from your, from your grandparents, how tough it was back in their days when they had to walk to school in the snow, up to here, uphill both ways. You know, remember all those stories? You realize we've got people today that's going to be telling the story. You should have been there back in 2020. And seeing all that was happening in this world. How many are ready for 2021? It's only October. The ball hadn't dropped, but I'm ready. I told the early church this morning, I'll kiss my wife right here this morning if we can just start 2021, you know. I am done with 2020. This has really been a tough year. Now, they say that a picture is worth a thousand words. So, as I was thinking about this, I went searching on the internet for a couple of images that might describe how many of us feel about this year. And here's how someone felt at the end of last year about this year. And you can see here, they felt like that they were a knight in shining armor, completely shielded in protective gear with a double-edged sword slung across their shoulder. They were, they were completely confident that they were ready for anything that 2020 might have to, show, to throw at them. In fact, the caption reads, me being prepared for 2020. Now, that was a depiction of how that guy felt at the end of last year about this year. The next picture shows after 2020 I actually arrived and how the guy feels now about this year. He thought he was prepared, every square inch covered, protected from anything, and wouldn't you know it, that thin little slit that he was to look through, one arrow precisely made it through and embedded right between his eyes. I mean, there's a, there's a lot of us felt that way at the end of 2020, we, uh, 2019. We thought things were going well. The economy was booming. Our IRAs and 401ks were growing. The, the workload looked like it was going to uh, be sustaining us for a long future time. Things just seemed to be clicking right along until about the end of February, beginning of March, when that arrow hit us right between the eyes. Well, here's another image that shows uh, the ratings that someone posted online for the year 2020. Uh, they, in their opinion, 2020 only gets one star, and the caption reads, very bad, would not recommend. Of course, you don't have any choice. You got to take it whether you'd recommend it or have it or not, but really hasn't been a great year. <clears throat> uh, here's another image that shows the first uh, family along with the Pope and the girl from the horror movie, The Ring. How many saw, saw the horror movie, uh, The Ring? That, that movie, I didn't see it, but I looked it up, and it's evidently based upon uh, people finding this video cartridge, and they would take it home and watch it on their TVs, and this image of this, this scary little girl would appear and then flick into some wicked, evil woman and back and forth and, and put the terror inside of you, and then your phone would ring. And when you answered the phone, whoever on the other end would say, now that you watch this movie, you got seven days left to live. In seven days, you'll be dead. And uh, the guy who posted that picture says, I photoshopped the girl from the ring into this picture, and it doesn't even seem weird. I mean, it, it's like we're all just waiting for the other shoe to drop. What, what's the next? Okay, it's 2020. What's the next bad thing that's going to happen um, this, this year? <clears throat> Uh, when's this going to end? How's this going to end? Is this ever going to end? We're all thinking those kind of thoughts because it's really been a bad year. And if that is you this morning, I'm here to tell you, you are not alone. There are a lot of other folks going through 2020 with you. In fact, there are some here who are having the very worst year of their life because they have lost the dearest one on earth. 
to them this year. Now, I bring that all to our attention because this is exactly what's happening in our Scripture this morning. This is the sits and Laban. This is the context. This is the situation. It's what's happening in our text. For Jesus and his disciples in John chapter 13, this was the very worst year of their life. Our text this morning says, Now before the feast of Passover... When Jesus knew that his hour had come to, to depart this world and return to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end, to teleos. That Greek word translated to the end is from the same word that Jesus will utter on the cross when he says, to Telestai. It is finished. And he'll breathe his last and give up the spirit. This was the last supper that Jesus would have with his disciples. And of course, the last supper that his disciples would have with him. This was the end. And being the end, he showed his disciples how he would love them to the very end. And John describes it happening this way. During the supper, when the devil had already put it into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray Jesus. Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands and that he had come from God, he was going back to God, he rose from supper, he laid aside his outer garments, and taking a towel, he tied it around his waist. And I, I'm not sure that I can describe to you the emphasis that the Greek text is placing upon the actions that were happening that evening. If you're reading the text this morning from the New American Standard Bible, you probably see that those words got up and laid aside his garments. They're printed with asterisks in front of them, those verbs. And that's because that's the way the translators of the New American Standard Bible decided to let readers know that a New Testament writer was using a historical present tense verb to heighten the vividness of what was happening on the occasion that it was describing. The author is trying to transport you in your imagination back to the table so that you are there with the disciples. He's been describing everything in past tense as if it's something that's already happened and he's informing his readers what happened way back there, but not now, not during the supper, not Jesus rose, Jesus rises. And we all look at each other. What's, this is during supper. We're eating. We're not done eating. We're in process of eating. We're drinking. We're conversing. Dinner's going on. And Jesus rises. What, what's going on? And Jesus lays aside his outer garments. What's he doing? Nobody at the table knows. Everything becomes deathly quiet. He takes a towel. And he wraps it around his waist. No one's ever seen a supper like this. And then he pours water into a basin and he begins to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel that was wrapped around him. Jesus, King of kings and Lord of lords, knowing that the Father has put all things into his hands, he washes the dirty feet of fishermen. 
and tax collectors right while the supper is going on. All 12 of them. Even Judas Iscariot's feet who would betray him. This was so out of place. Peter tries to stop him. Jesus came to Simon Peter who said to Jesus, Lord, do you wash my feet? And Jesus answered him, what I'm doing you do not understand now. But afterward, you will understand. Afterward? After what? Afterward, you'll understand that too. And Peter said to him, you shall never wash my feet. Now, the Greek is even more emphatic. The Greek records Peter using a double negative. The Greek records Peter saying this, You shall never wash my feet ever. It's kind of reminiscent of the first time that Peter met Jesus. If you'll remember, it was in a boat after Jesus filled it with a miraculous catch of fish so full that the boat began to sink and the next boat was filled so full it also began to sink. And when Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees saying, depart from me, Lord, I am a sinful man. Here Peter says, Lord, you will never, ever stoop so low as to wash my feet. And Jesus answered, if I don't wash you, you have no share with me. And here we begin to suspect that there's something more going on here than just the washing of dirty feet. To have no share with Jesus would be serious business. To have no share with Jesus, the ESV study Bible says, means that one does not belong to him. You don't have Jesus, and Jesus doesn't have you. Here the foot washing symbolizes the washing necessary for the forgiveness of sins in anticipation of Jesus' death for his people by which sins are washed away. Unless I wash you, Jesus says, you don't have that. Unless Jesus has washed you, you do not have forgiveness of sins. Jesus looks beyond Foot washing, the NIV study Bible says, to what it symbolizes. Peter needed a spiritual cleansing, and so did all the disciples, and so do you, and so do I. We are not clean in God's sight, and we need to be washed. Peter, still not fully understanding, said, Lord, if that's the case, not only my feet, but my hands and my head as well. Peter wanted to have Jesus. Peter needed to have Jesus. He needed to be cleansed by Jesus. And Jesus said to him, the one who's bathed does not need to wash except for his feet, but is completely clean. And you are clean, but not every one of you. And here John adds the reason why Jesus would say such a thing. For he knew who it was that would betray him. And that's why he said, not all of you are clean. And now it becomes obvious. Jesus was talking about a spiritual cleansing. A spiritual cleansing that Peter and John and all the apostles not only needed but would one day come to understand a washing that Peter and John and all the apostles would spend the rest of their lives offering to every man, every woman, every young person who wanted to be cleansed from their sin. Peter's the first one recorded as offering it in the Bible after preaching his first sermon in which he told the people, 
in their ignorance, they had crucified the Lord's Christ. And the Bible says, when those people heard that they'd done this, they were cut to the heart, and they said to Peter and to the rest of the apostles, brothers, what shall we do? And Peter said, repent and be baptized, every one of you, for the forgiveness of your sins. And you'll receive the gift of the Spirit. Jesus said that Peter would later understand. Here Peter is letting other people understand. Now this is the same thing that Saul of Tarsus will be told when Saul of Tarsus comes to understand that he has been persecuting Christ by persecuting all of Christ's followers. Saul was told, so what, now why do you wait? Arise and be baptized and wash away your sins calling on the name of the Lord. And Saul would spend the rest of his life traveling around the world as the apostle Paul, offering this same spiritual cleansing to anyone who would listen. Writing back to one of the churches that was now filled with people who had accepted such a cleansing, Paul would say to them, do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Don't let anyone tell you to the contrary. Neither the sexually immoral nor the adulterers, the idolaters, men who practice homosexuality, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. Don't let anyone tell you they will. They will not. And Paul says, such were some of you. But you were washed. You were sanctified. You were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. And now they had every hope of heaven when they did not have a single hope of heaven before. In fact, the Apostle John is allowed to look into heaven in the revelation that is given him at the end of the Bible. We call it the book of Revelation. It's actually the revelation of the Lord Jesus Christ to the apostle John while he's exiled on the Isle of Patmos. But in this revelation, John is allowed to see, among other things, in heaven those who have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Now, we have two among us who came to that understanding this week, and they asked to be cleansed. And we get to watch their baptisms here now this morning. It's very important that uh, this is backed by your faith, that you truly believe Jesus is God's Son and your Savior, do you? Yes. Repeat after me. I believe. I believe. Jesus is the Christ. Jesus is the Christ. The Son of the living God. The Son of the living God. He died for me. He died for me. I'll live for him. I'll live for him. Amen. Brian Wolford, because you now have confessed your faith in Christ as a fellow believer, by command of the Lord Jesus Christ himself, you're being baptized. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. For the forgiveness of all your sins and for the gift of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Yeah. God bless you, man. Yay. Thank you. I believe Jesus is God's Son, your Savior, but I need to ask you, do you believe he died on the cross for your sins? Yes, absolutely. Won't you repeat after me? I believe. I believe. Jesus is the Christ. Jesus is the Christ. The Son of the living God. The Son of the living God. He died for me. He died for me. I'll live for him. I'll live for him. Henry Wolford, because of your confession of faith, you too, like Brian, are being baptized into Christ for the forgiveness of your sins and the gift of his Holy Spirit. You're being baptized in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Hi, Are you okay? Right. <laughs> yes, I'm okay. Thank you. Right. Andrea and Brian Wolford, if we could have this microphone live here, Jim, I'd like for you guys to to uh, make your confessions in front of the church. Hold that up high towards your mouths there. Brian, I know you're a quiet individual, and uh, I want them to hear your confidence. Do you too believe that Jesus is God's son? He died for your sins too. Yes. Yes. Repeat that loud enough for these folks yes. to hear. I believe, I believe. 
Jesus is the Christ. Jesus is the Christ. The Son of the living God. He died for me. I'll live for him. Amen. Thank you. Yes. Andrea and Brian Wolford. I hope you get to know them. Wonderful, wonderful folks. Sit back here in front of the nursery. Um, Brian's a little quiet fella to be so large. He's awful quiet. And uh, you have to kind of draw it out of him. But he, he, he's a wonderful, wonderful man. And his, his wife, Andrea, is our new staff assistant here at the church. And uh, so I hope you do get to know her. She'll be the one that most likely answers the phone uh, when you call. Now, I feel like I could stop right here and we could call it a great morning. Amen? Uh, this is exactly uh, what Jesus said at the Last Supper. Uh, cleansing would be available uh, for all men. And he started with his own 12 chosen men and he would send them out into the whole world to, to preach for others to have the opportunity for cleansing as well. But there's more. There's more. I told the early church, I sound like an infomercial where they, they advertise a product, you know, that you want in your own kitchen and then they stop and they say, but there's more, there's more. You can have two of them for the same price, just pay a little more shipping and handling. But um, there is more. And uh, we know there's more because John goes on with his written record of what happened at this Last Supper uh, recording in John chapter 13. And John goes on to say, when Jesus had washed their feet and put on his outer garments and resumed his place, he said to them, do you understand what I've done to you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you are right, for so I am. If I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I've given you an example that you also should do just as I have done to you, washing feet and offering spiritual cleansing, doing both of these things just like Jesus has done for, the, for us, doing this for others just like Jesus has done for us. We need to do this for others just like Jesus has done for us. And that's what will make this church irresistible to those on the outside. That's our series that we're going through right now. How can we make this church more irresistible? Well, those of you who are in life groups will hear Jesus say this week, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another just as I have loved you, you also are to love one another. A love that will compel you to do what Jesus did. Get up from the table, get down on your knees, and wash other people's feet. Realizing whatever you're going through you're not alone. Other people are going through it too. And display with Jesus a love where the person sitting next to you is put ahead of you by you. You just don't see this much in the world where the person sitting next to you is put ahead of you by you. And put ahead of you by you because you learned that behavior from who? From Jesus. From Jesus. This is what Jesus did too. He got up from the table, he got down on his knees, and he washed other people's I need to uh, stop here for a moment and, uh, and clear up a misconception. C 
kindness is not a trait that someone is born with. As if some people are just born kinder than other people are. Folks, no baby is born selflessly kind. When a baby wants something, what does a baby do? No baby, no baby puts on hold what they want so that they can give someone else what they want. Nobody is born with this trait. It is not as if some people are just born with the nice gene. You know, preacher, you'll just have to excuse me. I'm just not a very nice person. Or you'll have to excuse that person. That's just the way they are. How many times I've been told that? We just, we just kind of laugh. That's just the way that person is. Well, someone needs to spank that person. That's what we do when babies grow up. And they still only cry about their needs not being met and don't care about anybody else. Nobody is born with a nice gene. Nobody is born with kindness woven into their DNA. I can assure you that the nicest person you have ever known, the most self-sacrificial soul you have ever seen, was not born that way. I'm thinking about my cousin Susie. And I don't know, Susie, if you're online, forgive me. She's still in the hills of West Virginia, but we get the internet down there too. We go to McDonald's to get it, but we get it. <laughs> but my cousin Susie is the sweetest person I've ever known. She's about a year older than me. She was raised in the mountains with me. And uh, she, is, she is so, so syrupy sweet. It'll make you sick. <laughs> but you know, she is sweet just like her mama was. I wonder where Susie got her sweetness from. She got it the old-fashioned way, folks. She earned it. She worked for it. And her sweet mama, my dear sweet Aunt Elizabeth, sweet, sweet soul, that she was. When little Susie wasn't so sweet, I'm sure sweet Aunt Elizabeth taught her how to be sweet. And to put other people's needs ahead of her own. That's how people become sweet. Through a lifetime of training and service, a lifetime of getting up from the table, getting down on their knees, and washing other people's feet. How many times do I remember as a little child, Aunt Elizabeth getting up from the table to serve some little need of me? Is it really surprising that her daughter, my cousin Susie, today is so, so sweet? Putting the person beside you, ahead of you. That was something even Jesus' closest disciples had to learn to do. Luke records an occasion in chapter 22 when a dispute arose among these 
12 disciples as to which one of them was to be regarded as the greatest, not their proudest moment. I'm the greatest. No, you're not. I'm the greatest. Surely not. Surely, yes, it happened. The chosen 12 are arguing about who's number one. And this wasn't the first time they had that argument. If you go back to Luke chapter 9, you'll find they had this argument, the same argument once before, when Jesus had to put a little child in front of them, and Jesus said to these 12 arguing men, whoever receives this child in my name receives me, and whoever receives me receives him who sent me. For he who is least among you, he's the greatest. But it seems that lesson of Luke chapter 9 didn't sink in. Folks, it usually doesn't. It usually takes time (laughs) for people to learn how to be kind. It usually takes time for people to learn how to be kind. Quite a few times, some of us hardheads take a long time. It took at least a second time, maybe more, but at least a second time for Jesus' chosen men to learn how to be kind. Here we are, a dispute arises among them as to which one of them was to be regarded as the greatest again, where Jesus has to say to the men again, The kings of the Gentiles exercise lordship over them, and those in authority over them are called benefactors, but not so with you. Rather, let the greatest among you become as the youngest, and the leader be one who, what? Serves. Serves. Let the leader be the one who's the most likely one to get up from the table, get down on his knees, and wash another's feet. He's the greatest. She's the greatest. That young person is the greatest because they are most like Jesus. They are the most obedient to Jesus who says, a new commandment I give to you, love one another just as I have loved you. Now, this is what our presenter this week in our life groups will call the platinum commandment. I'd never heard that that term before. Most of us have heard of the golden rule. How many have heard of the golden rule? Do unto others as you would have others do unto you. It's a pretty good rule. The world would be a lot better place. People live by the golden rule. It's golden, man. It's golden. They make a great world. But our presenter this week in Life Group is going to tell us, oh, there's a platinum commandment above the golden rule. The golden rule is golden, but the platinum commandment, oh. It says, love one another just as Jesus loved you. And folks, how much did Jesus love you? What was Jesus willing to do for you? How far was Jesus willing to go for you? This is my commandment that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love has no man than this, that someone laid down his life for his friends. And we know that there was at least one person sitting at that Last Supper table who got it. Because before the Apostle John dies, he writes this, By this we know love, that he laid down his life for us. And we ought to lay down our lives for the brothers. Wow. 
Jesus said, and I, when I be lifted up, and he's speaking about the cross, when the world sees me selflessly sacrificing my life for the forgiveness of their sins, when I am lifted up like that, I will draw all men to myself. Because there is something irresistible about someone who will sacrifice themselves for the sake of others. And there's something irresistible about a church that will do that for others as well. Let's stand. And let's pray that we will be that kind of church for them and for him who died on the cross for our sin. Amen? Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your son Jesus. It is incomprehensible to us how he would leave the fellowship he had with you in heaven, could come down here and be so mistreated and know that he would be lifted up on a cross to die for our sin. But that's how much he loved us. Help us to selflessly sacrificially love others for him now too. We pray that in Jesus' name. God's people said.